Oh my God. Season four of The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City was absolutely incredible. I've got so much to say, so let's dive right in. I want to hear your takes too, so give me all of your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video, share it, you know the drill. Okay, so I want to start discussing our constants, the core four, which obviously is comprised of Heather, Whitney, Meredith, and Lisa. Let's start with the bestie healing journeys, or healing, as Whitney might say. So season three saw a big rearranging of the group with Heather and Whitney falling out and Meredith and Lisa dealing with the residue of their fallout the previous season, forcing Lisa and Whitney together and Heather and Meredith together. I think that it was ultimately a good thing that the original duos were broken apart, as I think it would have gotten supremely stale if we were seeing four seasons of Whitney and Heather versus Lisa and Meredith. But season three was definitely heavy with both bestie pairs falling out, plus Jen's legal issues and general presence, so it was a positive thing for me when season four opened up and we saw both Heather and Whitney and Meredith and Lisa getting back on better footing. Let's start with Whitney and Heather. So we didn't get the full scene of their makeup, but saw via flashbacks that they were wanting to start fresh and move forward. And for the most part they did, albeit on different sides of the click eye with Whitney being closer with Lisa and Angie Kay, and Heather being closer with Meredith, Mary, and Monica, until of course the reality Von T stuff came out. We did see a few bumps in the road, such as Whitney's random freakout that Heather had exploited her vagina in her book, but I have to wonder if that fight was a manufactured diversion to throw Monica off the reality Von T's trail. I don't know, it's clear bad weather is not what it used to be, but I also kind of wonder how deep it was to begin with. They made a big to-do about how they were cousins when the series first started, but over time we learned that it was more of a 23andMe cousin situation, and they didn't grow up doing Thanksgiving dinner together or anything like that. They straight up didn't know each other until sometime shortly before the show, when, as we learned, Heather did Whitney's boudoir photo shoot. I think their true connection was in both of their rejection of the Mormon church and the anguish that came from leaving their past lives behind. I ultimately liked them better as allies than enemies, so I'm glad that they're mostly back in good graces with each other. And the bigger news was Meredith and Lisa getting back on better terms. Their fight got a lot nastier than Whitney and Heather's, with Lisa of course having her infamous hot mic moment at the end of season two. She's a whore. She's half of New York which Meredith did not forgive her for, getting back at her by bringing up rumors that Lisa took great measures to get places to pick up Vita Tequila, and looking into alleged financial issues that the Barlows were facing. The blood was bad between the two, and by the end of season three, the score of nastiness was pretty even, in my opinion. So that's why it was pretty surprising when Meredith approached Lisa at the Fresh Powder Fresh Start party in episode one, asking her on a walk where they could get back on better footing. The talk goes really well, with both apologizing to the other and talking about how much they've missed their friendship. They agree to come to the other first with any issues that may arise, but when Meredith implies a threat towards Lisa's bestie Angie Kay and her husband, you want me to go there with her husband? We'll explore that later. Lisa starts getting flashbacks to last season and decides to take a step back with Meredith. She doesn't like the threats and digging into finances and marriages, but she gets kind of sidetracked feuding with Monica, so when Meredith and Lisa get dinner later on in the season, Meredith is surprised to hear that Lisa has taken a step back and feels a bit betrayed that Lisa didn't come to her with the issue. Lisa is also an active participant in the Meredith takedown dinner in a cave in Bermuda, as well as on the boat the next day. But but is able to quickly put things aside when Meredith shares the news that Brooke signed with a modeling agency. Monica is upset at the whiplashy shift in dynamics between the two, but they explain that they have more of a sisterly relationship and have a middle setting between loving and fighting. They of course are bonded by the reality Von T situation and end the season in a seemingly good place. They're finding their way to a new type of friendship, one that won't necessarily be what it was pre-hot mic moment, but one they hope can be even better. I interpreted this to be them coming to terms with the fact that they are now co-workers and need to find a way to get along because neither of them are going any anywhere on this show. I think they both like each other to some degree, or at least have fun together, and both are smart enough and invested in making a good show, and know that it's not fun to watch their relationship stagnate in one place and not move forward. Ultimately, I'm glad all four of them were able to get back into a better place with their previous fallouts. It's inspiring to see reconciliation and bring about new dynamics when the ladies repair with each other. But let's shift focus to some of the rockier relationships within the core four, starting with Meredith and Whitney. So this started off in a delightfully dumb way, with Meredith opening the season upset with remarks Whitney had made in the press about her bathing preferences. Last season, our eyes were burned with the image of her and Seth in the bathtub, which Whitney talked about in the press as being gross and expressed her preference for bathing alone. Meredith is hilariously angry about her comments, giving us her best Whitney Rose impression. It creeps me out to get in a bubble bath <laughs> with someone else. Like, to me, a bath is for me. The two face off at the Fresh Powder Fresh Start party, with Whitney just being shocked that this is even an issue. It is my right to prefer to take a bathtub alone. Things get a bit darker between the two when the ladies take a trip to Palm Springs to stay at the Trixie Motel. 
It's technically Meredith's trip, but Whitney takes over in many ways, going down early with an uninvited Angie Kay, taking the best room, and putting on a drag show competition against Meredith's wishes. Meredith is annoyed but mostly lets this go until Whitney says that Meredith uses random tragedies as a trump card whenever she's under fire. This is a little tricky because it's definitely something Meredith does, but bringing it up also kind of undermines the tragedies. And there's definitely a spectrum regarding the tragedies and how relevant they are to whatever beef Meredith finds herself in. She was definitely justified to be upset when the ladies were questioned the date of her father's funeral in season two, and I think the nephew's mental health thing in season three, I think, right, was a good cause to be highlighting, but here in Palm Springs, it was a little random. She brings up toddlers being paralyzed for life, which is certainly sad, but I was never clear on who these toddlers were and what their relationship to Meredith was. I think Whitney is right that this is a tactic Meredith uses, but it also kind of makes her an asshole to bring it up, which Meredith is more than happy to point out. It's also not super effective messaging coming from Whitney, who is also someone who puts a lot of weight into her emotions and past traumas. Not to say she uses them to get out of confrontation, but she does really expect others to put a lot of respect into her feelings, and it's a big issue when others don't handle them the way she wants, such as with Lisa this season regarding her friend Shari's death, and last season with Heather regarding her childhood abuse. All of this did make me crave a Meredith and Whitney bestie era, because I think the two of them could really connect over their deep emotions, and be there for each other in a way Heather and Lisa couldn't be. They also have a great rapport when their husband's around. I love the scene where the Roses went on the Marx's podcast, and they discussed their relationship, so I think there's a path forward for for these two to really connect. I know I want to see it, but let me know if you're hoping for a Meredith and Whitney bestie era at some point. But let's shift gears and talk about how the LDS church played into season four, which will bring in the Lisa vs. Heather dynamic. I'm one of those people who's really into learning about cults and fringe groups and all of that type of stuff, so the Mormonism of it all is one of amongst many of my big draws towards SLC. And just to clarify, I'm not saying the LDS church is a cult, I'm 0% qualified to make a call like that. But yeah, so this season the way Mormonism manifested was predominantly through Lisa Barlow's son Jack deciding to go on a mission. This Kim is a shock to Lisa as Jack didn't let her into the decision-making process at all. She didn't even find out until it was decided that he'd be going, but involved many friends and his bishop in the discussion, leading Lisa to fixate on the fact that a lot of people knew about the mission before she did. Did you know Jack was going on a mission? Yes. Did you know before me? I knew for you. Oh, you did? She brought this up constantly, making the teens at Jack's mission location reveal party give a show of hands on who knew before her. Oh my gosh! <laughs> She's obviously really hurt that she was left out of this discussion, but continues to publicly humiliate herself by bringing it up, which was just very odd to me. Did anyone get why she was doing that? Explain it to me in the comments, please. But anyway, so even though Lisa wasn't led into the mission plan, she comes to terms with it and finds herself very proud of Jack's decision. She opens up about it to the ladies with one exception, the bad Mormon herself, Heather Gay. Heather finds out about Jack's mission through the grapevine and has a lot of opinions. Her take is twofold. One, she feels like Jack shouldn't go on a mission because he's spreading what she feels is a bad message and promoting a church rooted in racism and misogyny. She thinks Lisa doesn't really understand what she's getting herself into and thinks that Jack is going to come back radicalized. She gets into it with Whitney a bit over this, who kind of just wants to stay out of the whole thing, but Heather feels strongly in her convictions. I think this is fair. Both of them talk about how learning about the church's past with race and their own experiences as women were some of the main contributing reasons towards their decision to leave the church. I think Heather is right to be concerned with this. She knows intimately the reality of missionary life and what specifically the church teaches, and I think it's fair that she doesn't want to give the stamp of approval on that. She talks about how the missionary life is grueling and there's really not a lot of rest to be found while on the road. I think it's fair that she has these opinions given her history and wants Lisa to be aware of what Jack's getting himself into, but ultimately it's just not that productive. Lisa has no say in Jack's mission. That's been made clear. Plus, even though Heather may not have known this at the time, Lisa and her husband John made it clear to Jack that this isn't something he needs to stick with if he's not feeling it. It's important to him to go out and try and it's ultimately his business if he wants to stick with it. I understand Heather's trepidation in seeing him go down this path, especially given given her moral qualms with the church, but ultimately he's not her kid. I did really like seeing the missionary process, though. I didn't know too much about it, so I enjoyed scenes like the missionary locale reveal party, if anything for the novelty and inside view into the Mormon subculture. I also liked when Jack Barlow called it a mish. Pre-mish, they're supportive. Post-mish, they're even more supportive, and so they're very loving. But back to Heather and Lisa. So let's bring in her second major grievance, which was just generally with how Lisa performs Mormonism. Last season we saw Heather working on her book, and this season we saw her dealing with life after its publication, living out and proud as a bad Mormon. It seems to me she's having a smidge of buyer's remorse, happy to be free of the constraints of the church, but not fully ready to leave behind her old identity. I think she's feeling kind of shunned, or at least feeling kind of paranoid that others may be thinking negatively about her decision, and doesn't want to feel left out. So it really gets to her that Lisa gets to carry the Mormon identity, yet feels none of the constraints. 
constraints. She seems to feel a sense of injustice that Lisa gets to wear tube tops and own a tequila business. It came across as kind of obsessive to me, but I get that this is super deep for Heather. Being a Mormon has been her identity since birth, so she must feel a profound sense of grief in losing that community. There has to be some form of complex trauma in navigating through her upbringing and how she feels about the church now. So because of all that, I can see why it feels supremely unfair that Lisa gets to have her cake and eat it too, while she kind of had the worst of both worlds, having a guarded upbringing and a shunned adulthood. It's complex and very unique to Salt Lake City. I always enjoy the way that Mormonism clouds SLC, but I have to say that this season was my favorite version. All right, but let's move on to another big storyline, the rumors and the nastiness about Angie K and her husband, Sean. So this is mainly a Meredith versus Angie K feud, and it really takes some turns throughout the season. So early on, it's pretty clear that Meredith and Heather are trying to ice out Angie K. Meredith plans a trip for the ladies to Palm Springs and doesn't invite Angie K, claiming it would be weird if she did since they're not friends. And maybe this would be true if this was a non-film girls trip, but this is a housewife's trip, so my theory is that Meredith and Heather were trying to isolate Angie K so she'd be dropped from the show. I'm not really sure why because their charges against Angie K weren't really that serious. Meredith felt that all of the interaction she'd had with Angie K had been rather unpleasant the previous season and was upset that Angie said they'd never be friends. I don't think that necessitates icing someone out of the show unless there's something we're missing. Heather I guess had a more solid leg to stand on as Angie K had said that Heather got the black eye the previous season while doing quote Barbie scissor kicks with Jen aka implying they were hooking up. She also feels that because she and Angie have a long history history, knowing each other since high school. Angie should be most loyal to her, so she's upset that Angie's buddied up so much to Lisa and Whitney. So yeah, the two are mad at Angie K, but luckily Whitney takes it upon herself to invite Angie K on the trip, upsetting Meredith. On their first dinner, dressed in some of the wildest outfits in Housewives history, Angie K suggests that they toast to the Greek word of the day, which she has decided is fake, which kicks off the drama between her and Meredith. The two spar for a little while, but Angie K goes a little too hard, attacking Meredith's business, and Meredith just has the most epic meltdown. <laughs> confusing the waiter for security, and adopting an accent of sorts. Then you're embarrassing yourself. Lisa pulls her aside in an effort to calm her down, which doesn't work as Meredith starts dropping threats, again, adopting an accent of sorts. No, if I were to go for the jugular and talk about the sh the rumors, the nastiness about her, well, I can do that. Do you I know think... what? You want me to go there with her husband? I can go there. The rumors get brought back up in SLC at an Apre No Ski party, with us finally learning from Monica that the streets are saying Sean is gay. Nobody really believes this, like it's never taken as a serious thing, rather just something that's come up due to his job as a hairdresser and rehashed in a quest to hurt Angie. And hurt her it does, as we get a lot of very emotional scenes of her worrying about how it'll affect her family, especially her daughter Electra. Again, nobody really believes this, but it causes Lisa and Whitney to really side-eye Meredith, who denies spreading these rumors. Her defense is that it's not in her character to gossip about someone's sexual sexuality, citing her support of Glad and having a gay son as evidence. I'm inclined to believe her. Although she did allude to rumors being out there, it was never defined what those rumors were, and I agree that it's unlikely Meredith would use rumors about sexuality as ammo. Monica was the one that brought the gay thing into it. Plus, there were a lot more rumors and nastiness out there about Angie K, as we would learn when the ladies took a trip to Bermuda, such as the theory that Angie K was a member of the Greek Mafia. This was absolutely hysterical. I mean, I guess it could be true. We can confirm that Angie K is Greek, but I don't know. The idea of Angie K or Sean or her sweet father being in the mafia just doesn't compute to me. Plus, it seems as if Angie K didn't grow up with the extravagant wealth she has now, as this season she and her father spent some time reminiscing about growing up with much less. It seems as if it all came from her hair empire she grew with Sean, who, I may add, is not Greek, therefore excluding him from being a member of the Greek mafia. But it does become a big thing, so to review, apparently Monica and Meredith went shopping in Park City one day, and Meredith shared rumors that the Greek mafia used to have a stranglehold on the area, which led to speculation and googling by the two that Angie Kay's family was somehow involved. My guess is that Meredith was kind of just being absurd, as she is wont to do, and Monica read her as being literal. Or maybe she was being serious, I don't know, sometimes I have trouble following Meredith. Plus, they did just see a castmate go off to jail, so maybe they did genuinely think Angie Kay was in the Greek mafia. But things got strange when Monica and Meredith allegedly started getting DMs detailing Angie Kay's financial woes. These DMs bizarrely come in before the ladies are all going to dinner, which raises red flags that the DMs may be coming from inside the house. Angie Kay catches wind of these rumors, but when she confronts Meredith, Meredith about them at a pirate-themed dinner in a cave, Meredith pretty stoically denies it all. It's a far cry from her behavior in Palm Springs. The women are losing their minds accusing her of sending these DMs, and Meredith's just calm, continuing to deny her part in this. 
there's not really a lot that women can do since Meredith chooses to disengage from the whole thing. I think at this point, the picture of Monica's involvement in the reality of Auntie's thing was really starting to solidify, at least for Heather, and have to wonder if she had kind of clued Meredith in. This leads into our reality of Auntie's moment, so let's table this for now, but we'll come back to it soon. All right, but we have one more big feud to get through, which was Lisa versus Monica. This started off kind of dumb. Actually, the whole thing was kind of dumb, but as it began, Lisa lost her $60,000 ring in the airport bathroom after the ladies landed in Palm Springs. It's 60 Gs. Lisa, of course, made this a massive deal, talking incessantly about the ring and how expensive it was. Yeah, I lost my ring, Trixie. It's 60 Gs. Oh my gosh. Which annoyed Monica. During a round of the classic, not at all made up to cause drama game of warm and fuzzy, cold and prickly, Monica admits that she found Lisa's reaction a little bit over the top and felt it was a bit annoying as she's a single mother of four. It seemed like a grotesque display of materialism. Lisa fights back on this charge a bit, but it dies down until drag night where the two have totally opposite approaches towards dressing up. Monica goes all in wearing a wig, creating a character, and just being an all around good time, leading to her nabbing the crown, whereas Lisa has a full on meltdown at the thought of doing her own glam. I have glam in Monaco. I have glam in San Tropez. It was just so over the top. Like, producers were pulled in, just absurdly entertaining insanity, all culminating in her showing up looking as she always does. Monica is annoyed that Lisa didn't participate and reopens a previous issue of the ring situation. She elaborates a bit, calling Lisa the 1% and out of touch with most of America. Lisa does not take this well, and the whole thing erupts into Monica swearing at her in Portuguese. This is our first real glimpse into Monica's temper, but it wouldn't be the last. Lisa is really put off by the idea that Monica's putting forth that she's not relatable to middle America, which I mean, she's not, but I don't know. It bothered Lisa. Lisa is also really bothered by the rumors and the nastiness about Angie Kay. And while she's definitely more than aware of Meredith's role in the whole situation, she zeroes in on Monica being the person who really put it out there, or at least to find what these rumors were and gets to work turning Angie Kay against Monica. The issue is that she doesn't realize Monica and Angie Kay made up over slices of cake. So Lisa becomes irate when she sees the two buddying up at Whitney's daughter's luau themed roller skating party. Lisa is also put off by how Monica treated her mom at Greek Easter, not knowing the backstory of their relationship. And when she brings it up, Monica doesn't take it well. We see that with Monica, fights escalate very quickly and she's prone to low blows on things like looks and age. She also compares Lisa to Ted Bundy in a roundabout kind of way, which Lisa latches onto. I think these low blows are part of Monica's demise. This may have flew in 2004, but in 2024, like, nobody is into attacks like this. But yeah, so Lisa and Monica are upset with each other for multiple reasons, leading to an epic confrontation at Whitney's jewelry launch party, reaching a fever pitch during a sound bath. I think the crux of the issue at this point was Lisa feeling a bit jealous that Angie K, who has big lackey energy, was now buddying up to Monica. She denies this and says that the issue is that Angie K isn't being honest about how she feels about Monica and that Lisa had kind of hated her on Angie K's behalf, but I don't know. I think Lisa was definitely concerned about losing her ally. I think to the audience, Lisa may have also been coming across a bit insensitive regarding Monica's mother. Greek Easter made Monica look kind of unhinged about her mom, but as we started to see all of these toxic sit-downs between the two, the picture grew clearer that her mom was incredibly difficult to deal with. Lisa starts a campaign that Monica is making up the mother issue for attention or to skirt responsibility for her own nastiness, which to me came off super insensitive. We saw with her own eyes that LD was kind of a monster, but to be fair, Lisa wasn't seeing this. The two spent most of the middle of the season sniping back and forth with each other, with Lisa notably saying she'd choose Monica to be injected from a covered wagon because she doesn't support other women. But the two have a small breakthrough at that Pioneer Day event when Lisa finally apologizes for the comment she made about Monica's relationship with her mother. Things actually seem pretty good between the two early on in the Bermuda trip, with Monica even asking Lisa to join her to go meet her family. When that falls through, we see Lisa being a great comfort to a devastated Monica and even see Lisa defend Monica during the whole DM situation with Meredith in the cave. The relationship totally dissolved, of course, during the reality of Auntie's reveal. I think ultimately their feud brought a lot to the season. We had such ridiculous moments come from it, such as disrupting the sound bath with their arguing or screaming at each other just as pioneers. It did get a touch nastier than I typically like. Again, I think we've evolved past attacking someone for being older than you or calling them ugly, but I think it worked more because the ladies immediately charged back and told her to stop when Monica would go there. It's a shame we don't get to see more of this feud, at least in the near future. And last, the big story of the season, the reality of Von T's situation. So, in the season trailer, we see Heather get some sort of devastating call on the cast trip to Bermuda, so we knew all along that something big was coming, but this was coming off the heels of the Black Eye in season 3, a similar situation in which it was teased in the trailer and then ended up being frustrating and not resolved in a satisfying way, so I wasn't holding my breath that this moment would deliver. So, to back up a little bit, remember that Meredith was in the hot seat on the Bermuda trip for allegedly sending DMs to herself and Monica, detailing Angie K's alleged involvement 
involvement in the Greek mafia and her financial issues. We were led to believe that the cast was believing it was Meredith, given her past history of looking into other people's finances and hiring PIs and all of that. Heather was making a lot of mention about how her big issue was that someone in their friend group would meddle in this way, that they'd make a fake account DMing their friend in order to spread gossip. We even see Heather and Monica discussing the whole ordeal on a beachside walk, with Monica saying she doesn't see Meredith doing something like that, but jokes that it's something she would do. Heather does not like this one bit. We'd also seen a little bit of sniping between the two on this trip, with the big issue being that Monica had asked Heather about her daughter's sex life, which Heather did not want to discuss. But then in the last episode, we finally get the reveal of that fateful phone call and find out that Monica had been running an Instagram page called Reality Von Tees, which had been spreading rumors about the ladies since season one. Heather gathers the core four on the beach and fills them in, so they are prepped to confront Monica at their Bermuda Triangle-themed final dinner. Monica doesn't spend too much time denying it, and we get one of the most epic dinners in Housewives history. The episode ends with a looming monologue from Monica about how there's so much more to the story and she can't wait to reveal everything, but once we got to the reunion, I don't think there was all that much more to the story that we didn't know. So I thought this storyline was completely enthralling. I thought the finale was one of the greatest single episodes in Housewives history. The way that it was revealed in Heather's narration was so satisfying. It was like watching the great reveal in a detective mystery movie. The scene on the beach was straight out of Big Little Lies with their hair blowing in the wind and their shocked faces. And it was great to see the core four come together and demonstrate the strong bond they've made being through so much together on the show for four seasons. The big reveal has also added rewatchability to the season as there are clues thrown in that Monica was not necessarily who she said she was. There's also been talk that Heather, if not other cast members, knew about the whole thing much earlier than it was revealed. We now know that Jen had served Monica and her partner as a cease and desist in 2021 and had apparently alerted the show as to what was happening, so it's very likely that Jen had said something to the other ladies. If that's the case, then it definitely colors the season differently and adds a new level to the strategic thinking that was going on. I feel like you can see it with Heather. If you watch back, you can see that she almost looks disgusted with Monica at times. I think Heather cares enough about being a housewife and making good television to suck it up in the moment and create this grand reveal, so I definitely definitely think she knew well ahead of the Bermuda trip, but I think she made a good choice in revealing it the way she did as it was truly spectacular. But it definitely saw Monica out as a housewife. We saw that the ladies found this to be an unforgivable act, so let's examine this a little. From Monica's perspective, what she was doing was a good thing. She claims her sole motivation was in exposing Jen as an abusive employer and eventually helping with the investigation into her crimes. She claims that any statements made against the other ladies were just restating something Jen had said so they'd know what she really thought of them, or weren't posted by her but one of the other members of the reality Von T's team. I think that's fair from our perspective. A lot of people pointed out that the ladies were able to still film with Jen, who did much worse, both with her crimes against the elderly and with how she treated the women, but I can also see that Monica did majorly give them the creeps. As Heather pointed out at the reunion, this wasn't an account that posted sporadically, it was incessant, tracking their every moment and tagging them constantly to make sure that they saw every mean thing Jen had to say. I can see that Monica felt her intentions were good and thought the ladies would want to know what Jen had been saying, but I think the level of obsession would weird me out too. There was also the element of deception. Monica came in as if she was mostly new to the group, having just met the ladies a few times in passing, but really she knew everything about them. I know I would majorly have the ick if I was in the women's shoes. I would be beyond creeped out. But was what Monica did worse than what Jen did? Of course not, but I think Jen had some sort of coercive control over the ladies. I've gone into detail on that in my SLC Season 3 video if you want to dive deeper into that, and I think that, as Heather mentioned in the finale, they'd finally gotten free from Jen and didn't want to bring that element of fear back into their lives by keeping Monica around. So while I think this story made for an absolutely epic finale, it was kind of an Icarus situation and Monica flew too close to the sun. I don't really know what would have been a better way to handle it. I wonder how it would have went if she'd been the one to come clean to the ladies. We'll see if time can heal this wound and she can pop back up because she was incredible television, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. I could see Whitney or Angie K cracking and agreeing to move forward with her. She also has the support of Mary M. Cosby, so there is a path. One last question I have about the situation is the level of knowledge production was working with. I want to say that there's no way this wouldn't have come up at some point, especially given the cyst and deceased, but this is the group that brought us Jenny Wynn, so it's not a sure thing. Monica elaborated on the claims that they knew on the two T's in a pod podcast, saying that she told a member of production when testing for season three, but that person was no longer working on the show, so the message didn't get relayed. Production has also sworn up and down that they didn't know, but I don't know, it kind of comes across as the lady doth protest too much with the level of press they're doing denying it. It, so I'm kind of undecided, but I want to hear your thoughts and see what the Jen consent is. And before we get into our cast breakdown, I just want to give a shout out to the editing team because they are so good at their jobs. The music is just top tier. I love the Mormon Tabernacle Choir vibes. They were going absolutely insane during the whole reality Von T's reveal, and it just made the whole thing that much more intense. You are in my store, Monica. It is on my security footage.
They were always ready to provide a receipt via flashback and made scenes even funnier with their little antics. It's obvious that the people making this show love what they do and love these ladies, which just makes it even more fun to watch. All right, so let's discuss each cast member individually, starting with Heather, who had an extraordinary bounce back from a super rough season three. I discussed this a bit on my Best Sophomores video, but when the show premiered, Heather was really launched as the anchor of the cast. She was a grounding force to me, guiding us through life in Salt Lake City. She was funny, a fantastic narrator, and had this super compelling story navigating life since getting divorced and leaving the LDS church. She was exactly the right person to help ease us into this franchise. But with all the chaos Jen stirred up, as well as the rise of Lisa Barlow as a co-anchor, Heather kind of lost her reins a bit in season two. All out losing them as well as her fan fave status in season 3 when she showed Jen unwavering loyalty and was dodgy about the black eye situation. Finally free from the shackles that bound her, aka Jen Shaw, we saw a return to form for Heather and saw her step back into that center snowflake role. Making up with Whitney so early on I think was key for this, as she was mostly on good terms with everyone this season, at least until the explosive end with Monica. While she had fights here and there, she was pretty easily able to make up with Angie, Whitney, and Lisa when things came to blows. I also noted that she hosted a large number of the events this season, and she has a real genuine talent for narration, so I really felt like she stepped back up into the lead role. Heather really solidified herself as an all-star this season. As mentioned, this was my favorite iteration of her processing the trauma of her upbringing in the church. We see the tension in her really wanting to embrace this new life she's built for herself, a genuinely impressive one, while still craving the familiarity of her old life despite the damage it wrought. A kind of minor through line this season was her dealing with the fallout of writing her book. We saw her be pretty defensive about it. The time she seemed the most triggered this season, aside of course from the reality Von T stuff, was whenever someone would question her decisions of what was put into it, or when she felt the book was disrespected, such as Angie wanting Lisa to autograph it early on, and when Whitney felt Heather exploited her vagina in it at the end of the season. I'm really into this tension we get from Heather, both wanting to move forward in her life and break free from the life her pioneer ancestors forged for her, while still remaining kind of obsessed with the trauma that life wrought. It's juicy and very real. It kind of made me curious to read her book, so if anyone watching it has read it, let me know if you enjoyed it. As mentioned, I thought she made a fantastic choice with how she handled the reality of Auntie's situation. It wouldn't have been the spectacle it was if it weren't for Heather compiling the receipts, proof, timeline, screenshots, fucking everything to deliver the news in the most dramatic way possible. I'm so certain that she knew all of this info well before it was revealed, but she did a good job playing along with Monica until it was the best time to blow it all up. This season also kind of made Heather a gray moral character. I think early on she was propped up as the good one, the truth teller, and the one you root for, but with the reveal that Jen was the one that caused the black eye, we now have absolutely proof that she's not above telling a lie. I was happy to finally get the confirmation that Jen was the one who inflicted it, but was disappointed we didn't get the details, but now that we know Heather a bit better, I wonder if they'll eventually come out when it most benefits her. She did have to face the fact that she'd put production at risk with her dishonesty, but she did seem to finally get how messed up the whole thing was. I think that Heather was on such a pedestal after season 1 and 2 that the fans felt kind of betrayed with her season 3 performance, especially in regards to the loyalty she gave Jen, a loyalty that seems to still exist to some degree, but maybe that's more on us, or at least production for framing her in an incomplete way. When someone's propped up as the ultimate hero, it's going to hurt more when they let you down. But now I think we can have a more well-rounded view of Heather. She may not be an angel, but she's a damn good housewife, and this season really solidified her as an all-star for me. But let's move on to Meredith Marks, who also had a spectacular season after a relatively rough season three. Wow, what a performance. First off, the sheer quotability she gave us was off the charts. I can no longer say rumors without following it up and the nastiness, and it's all due to Queen Meredith. I now want to ask every waiter to throw someone out of a dinner all because of her. She also made the incredible choice to make bathtubs her thing this year, getting mad at Whitney for attacking her bathtub and then making a fuss in Bermuda when the ladies didn't give her a room with a bathtub. Also, her getting glam while hooked up to an IV in bed was absolutely transcendent. I also like the strategery we get from Meredith. She did a fantastic job navigating her attempted takedown, showing that it's best to stay calm if you know you're innocent. I do wonder if she knew that it was all Monica and was just biding her time until the moment it was revealed, but still, it was impressive the way she didn't give in to the emotions that injustice can bring and kept friendly contact throughout, like telling Lisa that Brooks got signed to the modeling agency. I do wonder if she'll hold a grudge going into next season, being upset that she was the initial target of the ire. The ladies have made it clear that they're over the underhandedness and the information dealing Meredith is prone to involving herself in, so we'll see if she cuts back on this since she's been caught or continues on with it. I thought Meredith was a lot of fun this season. So let's move on to Miriam Cosby. When it was announced she was rejoining the show as a friend, I was thrilled. She's one of the most interesting housewives to me because she's led such a unique life. It's almost like a real-life chosen one trope, like a Buffy or a Harry Potter, in that she was chosen as her grandmother's successor and, at least as far as I understand, has some deity-like aspect to her presence within the confines of her church. There's something fascinating to this type of figure, and I really wish we could delve more into how this is shaped her psyche. I also enjoy Mary because she's incredibly unpredictable. I've been surprised many times by her stance on things, and she says the most ridiculous things. Do you think I look inbred? I do. 
This can be good because she's often very funny, but sometimes it's a little too much and comes off as excessively cruel, sometimes even bordering into problematic territory. Luckily, she seems to have tampered that down as it didn't really come up this season. I think Mary is an enigma, but the cast has mostly stopped taking her seriously, so even when she says horribly mean things, it doesn't seem like it stings all that much. This season, we saw Mary take on a friend role, and I found that to be a good fit for her. She doesn't always want to attend events with the ladies and gets tired out by them easily, so I think that friend role allows her to go to what she wants to while not being obligated to attend things she'd rather not. We saw in the early trip to Palm Springs that she just doesn't have the social battery to be around these women constantly, so it seems like this is the better fit. It also puts less pressure on her to create some personal storyline or journey. We still got a few Mary solo scenes which I enjoyed, such as when she questioned her son on if he was married or not. I think these doses work really well for Mary. Regarding her comeback, I'm kind of fine either way. Again, I find Mary really interesting as a person, and she brings a wacky and chaotic element to the show, but I'm not sure it's absolutely mandatory she's on the cast. She kind of faded out in the back half and the show didn't suffer. Before it was announced Monica was leaving, I found it necessary to bring back Mary so Monica would have someone to film with, but now that she's leaving, it doesn't seem as necessary. I do think there's an interesting angle in seeing how the cast deals with her loyalty towards Monica, but I'm not sure it would be a capital T thing, as I don't know how much of their emotional energy they put into Mary's opinions. Oh, and just to give some closure to something I mentioned a long time ago, I think in my cast trips video talking about the Zion trip from season 2, I did start looking into the Meredith and Mary friendship to make a video about, and found that it just really wasn't all that interesting. While it may seem strange on the surface, is, I think they really just bonded over having sons and being into fashion. They're both a bit eccentric, and I think Meredith just really gets a kick out of Mary. Mary's also never targeted Meredith, at least that we've seen, in any real nasty way, so Meredith has no reason to dislike her. I think Mary may also be someone who's edited to show her more outrageous moments, and her more ordinary moments are cut out to shape her character. The reason I say this is that around the time it was announced that she was leaving after season 2, she joined a Twitter Spaces, which is kind of like an audio hangout of sorts, and I listened to her be totally normal for like an hour. It was kind of a striking moment to me, as it totally annihilated the view I'd had of Mary as this wacky larger-than-life figure. So yeah, I think Mary has a lot more moments of normalcy than we're led to believe on the show, and that explains the Meredith-Mary connection. Alright, but let's move on to Miss Baby Gorgeous, Lisa Barlow. I think this was a strong season for Lisa, but she always has strong seasons. She was kind of insufferable, but not really in a bad way, if that makes sense. She had an absurd number of meltdowns, and did do a lot to fight the materialistic and vain charges lobbed onto her by Monica, but I don't care. I don't want her to be down to earth, I want her to be ridiculous. This season we got more insight into her role into the family dynamic, with many scenes of John and Jack seeming at wit's end with her. I would wonder if the show had gotten to her head, but she's really kind of always been this way, so I don't think that's it. I don't really have much more to say, but I just love watching Lisa Barlow. Let's move on to Whitney. I think Whitney doesn't get enough credit for how vital she is to the cast. Lover or hater, she's always game to stir up drama, and this season was no different. We can all say thank you to Whitney Rose for insisting Angie K come on the trip to Palm Springs, birthing Meredith's meltdown. She's also responsible for Lisa's meltdown over glam in Palm Springs. Can Whitney be a little tryhard? Yes, I'll admit that. The exploited my vagina meltdown in Bermuda was a little over the top, and while I understand that she had only then read the book, I don't think most reasonable people would believe that Heather's book wouldn't have sold if it didn't detail Whitney's boudoir photo photo shoot, but still, she entertains me. This season, she opened up about the marital struggles she and Justin are facing, and I kind of worried for them. We saw her struggle with Justin getting back to work and worrying that she'd fall back into a housewife role after a year of being the breadwinner. We also saw more of her relationship with her daughter, who she clearly adores. I remember seeing rumors that she was on the outs with the cast while the season was filming, so I'm glad to see that they weren't true. That's about what I have to say, but I do enjoy Whitney as a housewife. Okay, yay, finally time to talk about Angie Kay, the love of my life. Ignore anything neutral or negative I said about her in my season three retrospective because I was young and naive then. Angie K is my world. Okay, you get it. But yeah, I just really grew to absolutely adore her this season. What I think really works about her as a quasi-newbie is that she has genuinely deep ties with the ladies. I really enjoyed how she and Heather's friendship ebbed and flowed this season, and how their long history, knowing each other since they were 15, colored their relationship. She's game to bounce around in her loyalty, and her follower energy is needed on this cast. We saw just how irate Lisa grew when she thought she was losing her to Monica, so I think that demonstrates the value that a beta-type housewife can bring to the show. The alphas need allies, you know? Something I love about Angie K is her sweetness. She can be a really genuinely good friend, and I found that really endearing. She also has such color. I love her poodle, and I love her love for her daughter, Electra with a K. I love her massive sunglasses. I love her Greekness. She's just such a fun addition to the show. And last, the new greatest one-season wonder of all time, Monica Fowler Delgado Garcia. I may have missed a few last names. I apologize. Wow. This was a performance for the books. I almost wish that the Reality Von T stuff wouldn't have happened, because there was so much to Monica that went unexplored. She talked a bit about her affair, but I'd like to hear more about it. We didn't really learn 
on why it happened or too much of the fallout besides the excommunication from the Mormon church. I also wish her relationship with the church could have been more properly delved into. We got bits about how devoted she was before the affair, and I want to understand that version of Monica. We also got a new iteration of the toxic mother-daughter relationship we've seen before on this show, as we got a lot of Monica and her mom, LD Millionaire, this season. This was a doozy. Seeing them together definitely explained why Monica was so quick to go below the belt in her fights, and there was the implication that her grandmother had a cruel streak to her as well. It definitely made for explosive TV, and I'm sure a lot of viewers saw their own relationships with their mothers in Monica and LD Millionaire. Monica also made sure there was conflict this season. We saw that she was very quick to escalate a fight, and I think she was one of the main reasons the show was so good this year. The decision to put her on pause has been polarizing, so I want to hear y'all's takes on it. Do you think she'll be back one day? Do you think it was the right call to let her go? Let me know. All in all, I absolutely love this season. I'd really recommend rewatching it after the big reality Von Tease reveal, as I had a lot of fun spotting signs and paying close attention to the women, specifically Heather's reaction towards Monica as the season progressed. Let me know what you thought of this season, especially all your thoughts on the reality Von Tease of it all. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share it with anyone who may be interested. If you want to connect on social media, my ats are deeply super fish. I'll link them in the description. But for now, I'll have to look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye!